tonight, three weeks to the election. There are two different visions for the road Texas wants to be on. Texas hasn't seen a race like this in decades. I'm not running against anyone, not running against another party. I'm running for this country. Republican Ted Cruz asking Texas voters for six more years in the Senate. Beto O'Rourke, hoping to be the state's first Democratic senator in 25 years. Now, live from San Antonio, both candidates face to face in the Texas debate. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Sarah Forgani, news anchor at Kent's 5 in San Antonio. And I'm Jason Whiteley, political reporter and host of Inside Texas Politics at WFAA in Dallas-Fort Worth. We welcome our viewers from across the state watching this debate live tonight in all corners of Texas. So let's get right to it. Both campaigns have agreed to these rules tonight. For each question, the candidate will get 90 seconds to answer. His opponent will have 90 seconds for a response, and we will turn back for a final rebuttal of 60 seconds. Let's first, though, turn to Dallas, to our Victory Park studios, where we have a social media response team there. So as you watch this debate on television with us tonight, join in the conversation online using the hashtag Texas debate. Now we also have a live audience with us here tonight in the studio, so we ask you to please hold your applause during this debate, except for now, as we welcome the two candidates running for the United States Senate in Texas. Please welcome Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke here. Gentlemen, welcome tonight. Senator Cruz, you won the coin toss to have the final word tonight at the end of this program, so therefore we start with you, Congressman O'Rourke. Welcome to you. 21 days away from election, and there's still uncertainty about the security of our ballot boxes. And just yesterday, new cyber attacks again reported on election databases in several states. But misinformation online can be just as dangerous as so many people know. The question is, should Congress enact regulations on social media to protect voters from that misinformation. First, Jason, let me thank you and Sarah for moderating tonight's debate, Ken's Five, for hosting us, the people of San Antonio for being here, and the people of Texas for watching this and participating in one of the most important decisions of our lifetimes. Es un honor estar aquí con ustedes otra vez aquí en, en San Antonio. Yes, the integrity of our ballot box, 242 years into this experiment, the American democracy that is the exception, not the rule in world history, is sacred. And it's essential that we continue to protect it. It's under attack unlike any other time in this nation's past. We know because the intelligence community has reached a unanimous conclusion on this that the Russian government sought to undermine our democracy. In fact, President Trump's own administration announced the indictment of 12 Russian nationals who compromised the voter data of more than half a million of our fellow Americans. And we know they will attack us again in this election and the next unless we stand up to them now. So yes, let's protect the integrity of our ballot box, which is why I'm a little surprised that Senator Cruz has voted against the funding to protect uh, access to the ballot box and to ensure that your vote goes to the candidate of your choice. And yes, we must also ensure that on social media, where so many of us now have become the product uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, that we are not manipulated and that uh, opinions that we hold are not shaped by those from other countries. So I want to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, work with this administration to make sure that we do that and every single voter can make an informed decision based on accurate information. Congressman, that is your time. 90 second response, Mr. Cruz. Of course we should do more. Uh, to protect the integrity of elections. And, and I'm proud to have supported, number one, funding from the federal government to the states to help secure our elections. But number two, just a week ago, the Senate Judiciary Committee passed legislation that, 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 that I co-sponsored called the Deter Act that would punish anyone that comes to this country with the purpose of undermining elections. We need to make sure our elections are safe and secure. Now, your question was, should Congress be regulating social media companies and, 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 and what they allow to be said? I believe in the First Amendment. I don't believe Congress should be in the business of regulating conduct because I don't think it's government's job to, to, to regulate content, rather, uh, on, online. That being said, I am very concerned, and I know there are millions of Texans who are concerned, 
about the political bias of big tech, of Facebook and Google, skewing and silencing the voices of those who politically they disagree with. You may remember several months ago, Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, testified before the Senate. And, and I asked him a series of vigorous questions about the political bias at Facebook. Now, even though Congress shouldn't regulate the content, there are two things we should think about doing. Number one, right now, big tech enjoys an immunity from liability on the assumption that they would be neutral and fair. If they're not gonna be neutral and fair, if they're gonna be biased, we should repeal the immunity from liability so they should be liable like the rest of us. Number two, the giant tech companies, by any measure, are bigger than AT&T was when it was broken up under the antitrust laws, bigger than Standard Oil, and if they're abusing market powers and monopoly, the Senator, antitrust laws should be enforced. Senator, that is your co time. Congressman, to be clear, he said that yes, we should enact, Congress should enact regulations on social media. Yes or no, in the, in, in the remaining 60 second rebuttal here for you, yes or no, for regulations on social media? Yes, I, I think we can have thoughtful regulations that ensure that we're making informed decisions based on facts and the truth, and we're not being manipulated by foreign powers. But it's interesting that Ted Cruz invested more than $5 million in Cambridge Analytica, which is the very company that helped to undermine our democracy, to feed false news and false opinions to our fellow Americans to manipulate the world's greatest democracy. Five million dollars from Ted Cruz that funded Cambridge Analytica. He voted against uh, supporting and safeguarding the integrity of our ballot box. And our junior senator uh, will not stand up to President Trump, someone who apologizes for Russia, defends that country, Vladimir Putin, the leader of the country that sought to undermine our democracy. He won't stand up against him and he won't stand up for us to make sure that our elections are free and fair, that your vote goes to the intended candidate. This, this is beyond party politics. This is, getting, uh, this is getting our democracy back on track. And we need a, a senator from Texas who will do that. Congressman, that is your time. Senator Cruz, Brett Kavanaugh was sworn in 11 days ago. The U.S. Supreme Court now has five justices who have either directly stated or suggested that Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided. Should we prepare for changes to abortion law in this country? Well, listen, I, I believe that every human life is a gift from God, is a precious gift from God, and it should be protected. It should be protected and cherished. I'm pro-life. And now, the question of what will happen at the Supreme Court on Roe versus Wade or anything else, we'll have to see when cases are decided. Judge Kavanaugh, just like his predecessors, just like Justice Ginsburg, just like Justice Kagan, declined to answer those questions, and that's been the standard at the Supreme Court for many, many years. I would note, though, on the question of life, there is an enormous difference between me and Congressman O'Rourke. On the question of life, Congressman O'Rourke is at the extreme pro-abortion side. So he has repeatedly voted in favor of late-term abortions. He has repeatedly voted in favor of taxpayer funding for abortions. I've got to say, that, that's not consistent with the views of the people of Texas. The people of Texas, and I will say especially the Hispanic community, we don't want to see taxpayer-funded, Medicaid-funding abortions and late-term <coughs> abortions. I think that's extreme and, and, and that's disconnected. And I, and I will note as well, on the question of judges, judges is a massive divide between Congressman O'Rourke and me. I was proud to help lead the effort to confirm Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. I was proud to help lead the effort to confirm Justice Brett Kavanaugh to the court. Congressman O'Rourke would have voted against both of them, and he wants to see, like Hillary Clinton promised to appoint, left-wing judicial activists who impose their own policy preferences from the bench. I, I don't think that's what the people of Texas want. We want Senator, judges and time. justices who will follow the Constitution and follow the law. That's your time. Thank you. Congressman, you have 90 seconds for response. Senator Cruz has a very troubling record when it comes to judicial nominations and confirmations. He supported the nomination of a judge, Jeff Mateer, who described transgender children as part of Satan's plan, believes in conversion therapy. He supported the nomination of a judge, uh, someone to be a judge who'd never tried a case before, An another potential judge who could not tell us whether Brown versus the Board of Education was correctly decided. From our perspective, in a state where you can be fired for being gay, I want justice who believes in civil rights. From the perspective of a state that ranks 50th in voter turnout in the country, not by accident, by design, some people drawn out of their democracy, I want a justice who believes in voting rights. And for a state that is at the epicenter of the maternal mortality crisis, as we made it harder and harder for women to get access to the health care that they need, 
to get that cervical cancer screening, to see that family planning provider, to see a provider of any kind. We're losing them faster here than in almost any other state, almost any other developed country in the world. I will only vote to confirm a Supreme Court justice who believes in a woman's right to make her own decisions about her own body and who has the health care access to be able to do so. We should be able, the next junior senator from the state of Texas, to work with our colleagues, to work with the administration, to have justices who will rule in favor of people and our needs, not corporations, not special interests, not the political action committees. Those are some very significant needs that we have in Texas right now, not represented by Judge, now Justice um, Kavanaugh. And so, yeah, this, this is a decision that I'm concerned about. That's your time. Thank you. Senator, in your 60-second rebuttal, what should abortion law in Texas look like? Well, you know, it's striking that, that Congressman O'Rourke didn't dispute his extreme record on abortion, supporting late-term abortion, supporting taxpayer funding for abortion, supporting taxpayer funding for abortions <coughs> late-term, even for illegal aliens. That is, an, and he's voted for that, that is an extreme position. Fewer than 9% of Texans agree with him. He also didn't dispute that he opposed Justice Gorsuch, he opposed Justice Kavanaugh. And if you listen to what Congressman O'Rourke said, he said he wants justices that agree with his own left-wing policy views. That's not the job of the court. The job of the court is to follow the law. If you want to change the law, you do it through elections. You do it, the Constitution gives the power to the people, not five unelected lawyers in Washington. And let me note, the same judges that Congressman O'Rourke wants to see would also undermine the First Amendment, would undermine free speech, would undermine religious liberty, would undermine the Second Amendment. Hillary Clinton promised to appoint justices who would undermine the Second Amendment, and Congressman O'Rourke enthusiastically supported her doing so. Senator, that's your time. Thank you very much. Senator Cruz, President Trump said on Sunday that something is changing in regards to the climate. You're clearly on record for years saying there's no evidence to uh, just back that up, that nothing exists yet to back that up. But major oil companies, including Texas-based ExxonMobil, says even on this website, the risk of climate change is clear and warrants action. That's ExxonMobil's own words there. So what do you tell Texas companies who think this really is a problem? Well, listen, of course the climate is changing. The climate has been changing from the dawn of time. The climate will change as long as we have a planet Earth. Um, I am the son of two mathematicians and computer programmers. I believe in science. I chair the Science and Space Subcommittee of the Senate Commerce Committee. And indeed, in that capacity, I chaired a hearing looking on the science and data behind global warming. And we heard testimony. We heard actual science and data. Far too many Democrats approach this issue, not as a matter of science. I think we should follow the science and follow the evidence. But instead, what they approach it as, as a matter of government power. They want the power to control the economy. That has led, for example, Congressman O'Rourke to cast some votes that I think are really harmful to the people of Texas. For example, Congressman O'Rourke voted in favor of a $10 a barrel tax on every barrel of oil produced in the state of Texas. That would have been absolutely devastating to the state of Texas. By the way, $10 a barrel, that works out to about 24 cents a gallon that every one of us would pay when you go fill up your car or truck. That would hurt the people of Texas. And let me point out, look, a robust energy sector is good for all of Texas. There are millions of jobs that depend on a robust oil and gas sector. And, and Congressman O'Rourke's record voting against Texas oil and gas, voting against energy, that hurts the economy, it hurts jobs. It's, it, it's not right for Texas. And let me point out, all of those oil and gas workers, they buy homes. They buy cars and trucks, they get health care, they, they give to churches and schools. And by the way, the University <laughs> of Texas and Texas A&M get hundreds of millions of dollars from our energy that, sector. That's your time, Senator. Let, let's move on to a 90-second response from Mr. O'Rourke. This is what you can expect over the course of this debate. Uh, Senator Cruz is not going to be honest with you. He's going to make up positions <laughs> and votes that I've never held or have ever taken. He's dishonest. It's why the president called him <laughs> Lying Ted, and it's why the nickname stuck, because it's true. Um, look, the, the climate is changing, and man-made climate change is a fact. 300 years after the Enlightenment, we should be able to listen to the scientists and follow their advice and guidance. And they tell us that we still have time, but the window is closing to get this right. If we're going to make our commitment to the generations that follow and not just think about the next election or our political career or pursuit of, of the White House, then, then we can make the right decisions now. We can support Texas being a proud energy leader in oil, 
and in gas, but also in renewable energy. Today, Texas leads the country. We're number one in the nation in the generation of renewable wind power. We're number five and moving up quick when it comes to solar. The two fastest growing jobs in the United States of America today, wind and solar jobs. We can continue to grow this economy. We can reject the false choice between oil and gas and renewable energy. Make sure that we produce and refine and transport and use our energy resources more responsibly. And listen, this isn't one political party saying this. This is people of both parties in every single county in Texas that we've had the chance to listen to people. These are folks who work in the energy industry. Amy and I were in Ira and Texas listening to those who work in some of these fracking operations. What they want is predictability and consistency consistency in the regulations, and then they will perform to them. Congressman, that's your time. Mr. Cruz, 60-second rebuttal. The question is, does ExxonMobil have it wrong here? Well, it, it, it's clear Congressman O'Rourke's pollsters have told him to come out on the attack. So if he wants to insult me and call me a liar, that's fine. But, you know, John Adams famously said, facts are stubborn things. So if you want to see the vote he cast for a $10 a barrel tax on oil, go to our website. It's tedcruz.org. And we will put up the exact text of the vote and a link to Congressman O'Rourke's vote against the people of Texas. Let me say, if you work in energy, if you work in oil and gas, Congressman O'Rourke's record on this is extreme. He didn't just vote for a $10 a barrel tax on oil. He's also voted for aggressive regulations of fracking, aggressive regulations of exporting liquefied natural gas. He's a prominent supporter of President Obama's Paris climate deal, which would have killed thousands of jobs in the state of Texas. That's not good for Texas, and it's an example of over and over again, Congressman O'Rourke sides with liberal extremists on the national level instead of the people of Texas, instead of jobs of Texas. And, and, and by the way, Senator alternatives time. are great too. Texas leads in energy across the board. Representative, this question is about immigration policy. Uh, we know your position and passion for the dreamers, and we know that you are adamantly against extending the existing border fence. This question here is specifically about border security. If we don't need a border wall, can you please look at the people of Texas tonight and tell them what we do need? I'd be happy to, and, and listen, I don't know that there's another person who has a greater stake in this issue than I do. Amy and I are raising Ulysses and Molly and Henry in El Paso, Texas, uh, one half of the largest binational community on the border, the, the defining border community. We care about our kids' safety. I care about the safety of those that I represent in Congress. I care about the safety of every single person in the state of Texas. El Paso, in fact, is one of, if not the safest cities in the United States of America. It's because we have world-class law enforcement, police and sheriff's deputies, but it's also because we are a city of immigrants. A quarter of those that I represent were born in a country, another country, chose us, came here to this country, and by their very presence, made it better. No wall is going to solve legitimate security concerns, but, but, but smart policy will. And let me describe uh, one of those to you. Senator John Cornyn and I, though he's a Republican and I'm a Democrat, he's in the Senate and I'm in the House, worked on policy together to invest in our ports of entry. That's where more than 90% of everyone and everything that ever comes into the United States first crosses. Having a better idea of who and what comes into our country demonstrably makes us safer. And at the same time, those customs officers are able to facilitate legitimate trade and travel that's connected to more than a million jobs in the state of Texas. As we all know, here at the home of Toyota, trade is the lifeblood of the state of Texas. If we can make our communities more secure, as this bill did, and facilitate more job-growing trade, um, then, then we've really figured something out. And I think that John Corner and I have been able to do it, Republicans That's and Democrats time, working together on an issue that makes Texas better. That's your time, thank you. Uh, Senator, you have 90 seconds to respond. So everyone should notice in his answer that he wanted to talk about trade, he wanted to talk about customs, he wanted to talk about everything except border security. And let me say, there's no race in the country with a starker divide on immigration than this race here in the state of Texas. As for me, I'm incredibly honored to have received the formal endorsement of the National Border Patrol Council, the union of the men and women who risk their lives keeping our nation safe. I, I will note here at this debate, I'm very pleased we have Brandon Judge and, and Paul Perez, both from the National Border Patrol Council. The reason they're supporting me is I've led the fight to secure the border, building a wall, using technology, increasing boots on the ground. We can keep our community safe. Congressman O'Rourke not only opposes a wall, but he has said we have too many fences and walls already on the border. He wants to tear down the ones we have. And I'll note, he brought up El Paso. El Paso is right across 
from Juarez, one of the most dangerous cities in the world, 3,000 murders last year. There's a wall there. That wall is one of the tools you use to protect us. But, but let me give you an example of just how extreme Congressman O'Rourke is on immigration. Kate's Law, common sense legislation, overwhelming majority of Texans supported. I'm the author of Kate's Law in the Senate that says violent criminal illegal aliens, if they're deported repeatedly, should face a mandatory minimum prison sentence. Congressman O'Rourke has voted against Kate's Law. That's wrong. We, need, we should not be releasing violent criminals into our community. Congressman, uh, in your 60 second rebuttal, can you tell us your specific plan to secure the border? Well, as, as I just told you, uh, Senator John Cornyn and I have worked to invest in our ports of entry. That means staffing of customs officers. It means infrastructure at our bridges that connect us with Mexico, where more than 90% of everyone and everything first crosses. And it means investment in the technology that ensures that we do a better, smarter job screening those who first come into this country. That will make us safer. It also means that we support <coughs> local law enforcement, those police officers and sheriff's deputies who keep this country safe. We can do that as well. But listen, uh, we cannot use this idea of border security to be an impediment to moving forward on those issues that are also demanding our action in which Texans know better than perhaps any other people of any other state. On issues of immigration reform, uh, the fate of DREAMers, nearly 200,000 in the state of Texas, when the Senate voted to move forward on debate for DREAMers, 98 senators showed up that day, 97 voted to, voted to move forward, only one senator voted no, stood in the corner while everyone else was at the table. Ted Cruz has put his career above the interests and priorities of Texas. Time. Ted Cruz is for Ted Cruz. That's your well, time. Thank and, you very and hold much. On a let, me, let me respond to that, please, which is I, I noticed <laughs> Congressman O'Rourke said we need to support law enforcement. I think that's striking that he says that now in a debate because his career has been one consistently of opposing law enforcement. Indeed, someone else who is here today is Detective Mike Kelly, who leads the San Antonio Police Officers Association. Senator Detective Kelly has endorsed me. And I would note as well, 171 elected Texas Senator, sheriffs, including... Thank you very much. We have to Hold on, on. I get a, a, a we'll 60 get seconds response. Hold on one second. We have both agreed to this. But, 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 but we agree we can have a 60 seconds. But we agreed on a 60 second sir rebuttal if necessary. And I want to make a point on law enforcement. That's he claims he supports. He already finished outset. his rebuttal. We have to move on to the next topic. <laughs> Gentlemen, let's talk about health care now. What you're looking at for our television audience is a live picture at our Victory Park studios in Dallas where that social media response team is listening to our viewers out there too. The overwhelming conversation online we're hearing about is about health care. And one post asks you directly, Congressman O'Rourke, if universal health care is going to cost trillions of dollars, what do you cut from the federal budget or how much are you going to raise my taxes to pay for that? Let's start with the goal. What, what is it that we're trying to achieve? I want to make sure that everyone can see a doctor, afford their prescription medications, take their child to a therapist, be well enough to live to their full potential over the course of their lifetime. And I want to make sure that working families pay less for health care costs than they do today. So here are some steps that we could take to get to your answer. Um, we could expand Medicaid. This is a state that left $100 billion on the table. We could expand Medicaid. More working Texans are able to be well enough to go back to work, to be there for their families. We could introduce Medicare as an option on the exchanges to drive down the increase in premium costs and expand selection and choice. And then we could take the lead as the state that is the least insured in the United States, who perhaps better understands the consequences of failing to be there by and for one another better than anyone else on guaranteed high quality universal health care. There are a number of ways to get there from Medicare for all to one where you use a, a mix of employer-based insurance and the ability for people to pay into Medicare. That could come uh, at a cost of around $1.6 trillion over the next 10 years. If you look at the tax cut that Senator Cruz just voted for, $2 trillion added to $21 trillion in debt, the disproportionate benefit flowing to corporations and the very wealthiest, and move that corporate tax rate, not to where it was, but maybe five points from 21 to 26, you would generate the, the money necessary to pay for <laughs> access to health care so that everyone lives to their full potential. Congressman, that's your time. Mr. Cruz, 90 seconds response. It, you know, I have to say, he really didn't want to ans answer the question of how to pay for it. So let, let me be clear what it, w what it would cost. Congressman O'Rourke is proposing socialized medicine the federal government in charge of your health care and your doctor. There are at least three big problems with that. Number one, every place on earth that happens, 
you have rationing and waiting lists. If you look at the United Kingdom, if, if, if a senior needs to get a hip replacement, it takes about 90 days. In the Canada, it takes about 200 days. But number two, the cost would be immense. When Bernie Sanders rolled out this plan, and Congressman O'Rourke supports the Bernie Sanders plan of socialized medicine, the Urban Institute, which is a left-leaning institute, scored it as costing $32 trillion over 10 years. That's $2.5 trillion in the first year. Right now, the total we raise from all of our in income taxes is $1.5 trillion. So Congressman O'Rourke's plan would require tripling your taxes. He said you could do it with five points on the corporate rate. That doesn't even pass elementary school math. We're talking about, and by the way, his next answer likely will be tax the rich. Well, let me tell you something. If you took every person in America making a million dollars or more, and you took 100% of their income, it would pay for five months of Congressman O'Rourke's socialized medicine. We can't afford those taxes. And third, he wants to put everyone who hasn't paid into Medicare on Medicare. That would bankrupt Medicare. It would hurt seniors. Seniors have paid into Medicare. They rely on it. And putting 200 million people, Senator including Tom, illegal immigrants, on it could, could, could bankrupt Medicare. Senator Cruz, at your time, uh, Mr. O'Rourke, if elected in your 60 seconds rebuttal, how do you get that passed? Look, all you've heard from Senator Cruz is what we should be afraid of. Um, it's a campaign based on fear. It's, it's the same person who shut down the government of the United States of America for 16 days, perhaps because he thought too many people had too much health care, has voted to take away health care from millions of American families, and vows to repeal protections for pre-existing conditions. Not I want true. people to have more health care. I want people to be well enough to finish their education, to go to school. I want to bring people of Texas together, Republicans and Democrats alike, from all parts of this state, to make sure that we lead on an issue that we understand better than anyone else. In a state where the largest provider of mental health care services is the county jail system. In a state where people are dying of the flu and diabetes, in the wealthiest and most powerful country in the year 2018, surely we can do better. And I've laid out some steps that would allow us to do that, beginning with expanding Medicaid, introducing Medicare as an option on the exchanges, and then describing the goal that we want to get to, and ensuring that Republicans time. and Democrats alike come to the table to work on that. Congressman, that is your time. Senator Cruz, there's a lot of concern in Texas and all over the country about President Trump increasing the tariffs. Toyota says Tundra trucks produced right here in San Antonio will increase in cost by $3,000 next year because of rising tariffs on uh, auto parts. Two nights ago on 60 Minutes, President Trump did not rule out increasing tariffs again. So the question is, do you believe tariffs threaten Texas growth? And if so, is it time for the Senate to step in and stop it? I'm against tariffs. I'm against a trade war. Is it I, 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 to it, let me answer the question. I'm against tariffs. I'm against a trade war. I have made the case repeatedly to President Trump that in, in trade, we should be expanding our access to foreign markets. We should be expanding our, the ability of Texas farmers and ranchers and manufacturers and energy to export our goods and services. If we are reducing the barriers, whether it is to Mexico or Canada or China or anywhere else, so we're selling more, that's a good thing. If we're erecting barriers and shutting down trade, that is a bad thing. On this, this is one of the few issues on which Congressman O'Rourke and I have some common ground in that we both spoken out in favor of trade. The difference is that I'm able to work with President Trump and make the case to President Trump. And we have seen, we have seen, for example, the president has negotiated a new NAFTA, a new trade deal that, that has benefits that should benefit the state of Texas, that should benefit San Antonio. Congressman O'Rourke is not able to work with President Trump. And indeed, Congressman O'Rourke is the only Democratic Senate nominee in the country who has explicitly come out for impeaching President Trump. That is extreme and it means if Congressman O'Rourke has his way, you know, he mentioned a shutdown. You wanna talk about a shutdown with Congressman O'Rourke leading the way two years of a partisan circus shutting down the federal government in a witch hunt on the president. That's not good for the state of Texas. It's not good for our country. Uh, Senator, that is your time. 90 seconds response from you, Mr. O'Rourke. Really interesting to hear you talk about a partisan circus after your <laughs> last six years in, in the U.S. Senate. Um, listen, um, if, if you have this special relationship with President Trump, um, then, then where is the result of that? Um, you are all talk and no action. Um, the tariffs that the president has levied, the trade wars that he has entered this country into is hurting no state more than it's hurting Texas. Our farmers, our ranchers, 
our producers, our manufacturers, and our exporters. Right here in San Antonio at the Toyota plant, where Amy and I bought our Tundra and met the folks who made it. Yes, we have problems with other countries around the world. China dumping aluminum and steel, manipulating their currency. And I want to make sure that we stand up to China. But when have we ever gone to war, including a trade war, without any allies? And that's exactly what the president, with Senator Cruz's help, would have us do. We've alienated the European Union. We've alienated Canada and Mexico. We've alienated all other potential partners, and we're going it alone against China, and it is not working. Just listen to the farmers. And I know you haven't had the chance to, to visit every county, but I have, and I've listened to them, and they are hurting. And the anxiety and the uncertainty of not knowing when these trade wars will end, or the certainty of knowing that when those trade wars do end, those buyers in those other countries will find other people from whom to have bought from and they will no longer be coming to Texas to buy what we grow, what we raise, what we export, and what we, what we manufacture. We need a senator who will work with the president when we can and stand up to him where we must. And on Congress these tariffs, time, we sir. must stand up to him. Uh, Senator Cruz, 60 seconds to rebuttal, but I want to ask you again, should the Senate step in and stop this? I, I think we should keep working with the president, which is what we have been doing. But, you know, Congressman O'Rourke just, just, just asked an interesting question. He said, where are the results? Congressman O'Rourke and I were both elected to Congress on the same day six years ago, November of 2012. We've served exactly the same length of time in Congress. In those six years, I have authored and passed 34 separate pieces of legislation, major victories for the American people. But he asked where are the results. I'll point to one front and center, which is the historic tax cut that I spent thousands of hours bringing senators together, getting passed. And he said, where are the results? The state of Texas is booming. We've got right now the lowest unemployment in 49 years. African-American unemployment is the lowest that's ever been recorded. Hispanic unemployment is the lowest that's ever been recorded. Youth unemployment is the lowest in 52 years. Texas is seeing the benefits of low taxes and low regulations. And Congressman O'Rourke's position is always, always, always in favor of higher taxes. He said in response to how Senator he pays for socialized time. medicine, higher taxes, that's not good Senator, for Texas. thank you that very much. Time. Representative O'Rourke, uh, you supported $15 billion to help victims of Hurricane Harvey. But two weeks after that, you voted against a bill that would have also given them tax relief. What do you tell those victims who are still struggling financially today, one year later? I've been with many of those who were affected by Harvey in the immediate aftermath, going to places like Rockport or Port Aransas, Houston, Beaumont, Port Arthur, and continuing to come back again and again to see what we can do to be helpful. I voted for more than 136 billion dollars in aid to support those communities who've been hit by natural disasters, including Harvey. And in the specific bill that you asked about, the, the tax relief was not as great as we have seen for those who have been through other natural disasters. I thought we could get a better deal. But I am there for those communities each and every single day. I continue to go back to places like Kashmir Gardens in Houston, Texas, which more than a year later is still not fully rebuilt. And I continue to wonder why Senator Cruz voted against more than $12 billion in FEMA preparedness, knowing full well that we will see more Harveys going forward. Mind you, that was the third 500-year flood in just the last five years. We know that there will be more of these floods coming, and I want to make sure that the people of Texas, especially Southeast Texas are prepared for the next one. That $12 billion also included hundreds of millions of dollars in support for volunteer fire departments like the one that I visited in Rockport, where of those 20 volunteer firefighters, more than half lost all of their worldly possessions and were sleeping on the floor and in the firehouse as they responded to the emergencies in their community. So yes, I will be there. I will work with anyone, anytime, anywhere to make sure that those Texans who need the help to rebuild get it and that we invest in their ability to be resilient Congressman, for the next Congressman, that's storm. your time. Thank you. Senator Cruz, you have 90 seconds to respond to that. Houston is my hometown. Hurricane Harvey hit Texas unlike any disaster we've ever seen. It's, it was devastating. I was home with, with Heidi and my girls during the hurricane and, 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 and for months thereafter spent time in virtually every community along the Gulf Coast, two, three, four, five times working with the state and local officials. I mentioned earlier 171 sheriffs have endorsed my campaign, including 10 Democrats. One of the reasons why the overwhelming majority of elected sheriffs have endorsed my campaign is because many of those sheriffs I worked with hand in hand after Harvey. In the Senate, I helped lead the effort to pass three major disaster relief bills. 
working hand in hand with John Cornyn where we improved and expanded those disaster relief bills. And the emergency tax relief that you just referenced was legislation that I authored. I authored, introduced, passed into law, did it jointly with John Cornyn and Marco Rubio. The Cruz Cornyn Rubio emergency tax relief gave over $5 billion in emergency tax relief for families impacted by Hurricane Harvey. It passed both houses of Congress overwhelmingly was signed into law, provided immediate relief for those impacted by Harvey. Only four Texas Democrats voted no on that legislation. One of them was Congressman O'Rourke, the congressman from El Paso, and, and there was a reason for that. You know, he gave an answer now. He said that it didn't provide enough tax relief. That's not what he said at the time he voted no. At the time he voted no, he said the reason he voted no is that he wanted, he, he wanted to focus on time, illegal Senator. immigrants That's instead of hurricane thank relief. You. That was his answer at the time. Representative, and that so, thank you, Senator. Representative, you get 60 yeah. seconds for a rebuttal. Do you regret that vote? I don't. I, I will always see what I can do, work with anyone, anytime, anywhere, to do better for Texas. And that, that was what I was trying to do. But, you know, Senator Cruz mentioned listening to and working with local leaders in Houston. Um, I've listened to and worked with the mayor and the county judge, a Democrat and a Republican, each of whom is still waiting for $1.1 billion awarded to the local governments in community development block grant funding that has still not made its way into the neighborhoods, into the streets, into the homes, into the businesses to rebuild. They need a full-time center, not somebody running for president who's gonna focus on their needs and make sure that that money gets there. They need a full-time senator who would have been at bat for them before the storm on infrastructure projects that they had identified needed funding, but they needed a senator who was going to work for them. Army Corps of Engineer approved projects totaling in the hundreds of millions of dollars who did not have an advocate because he wasn't in Texas. He wasn't in Houston. He was in Iowa. He was in New Hampshire. He was running for another office instead of taking care of the concerns and the needs of the people of Representative, Texas. Representative, thank you very much. Senator Cruz, a year ago this week, October 18th, 2017, you tweeted out the following statement. When it comes to the deficit and debt, it is immoral, the debt we have, yep. we have to yep. turn it around, you wrote. Yet two months later, last December, as you just mentioned a moment ago, you voted for the Republican tax plan that the Joint Committee on Taxation, Congressional Budget Office, and many other nonpartisans say will add more than a trillion dollars to the deficit. Some people see the tweet and the vote as hypocritical. Are they not? Uh, they are not remotely. I'm proud to have supported the tax cut. The tax cut is producing enormous benefits for the state of Texas and for the country. We're seeing record growth. We're seeing record low unemployment. It's, it's benefiting four million new jobs in the last two years. And, and, and by the way, one thing that, that, that Democrats never seem to understand, if you want to pay down deficit and debt, and I care passionately about the deficit and debt, it is immoral, the deficit and debt we've racked up. If you wanna do it, the only force strong enough to do that is economic growth. Now, let's go back to a little history. In the 1960s, John F. Kennedy, a Democrat, campaigned on tax cuts, cutting individual tax cuts and the corporate tax rate. He said a rising tide will lift all boats. He passed it, and the economy boomed and federal tax revenue went up. In the 1980s, Ronald Reagan campaigned on cutting taxes to get the economy growing. He passed it. The economy boomed and federal tax revenues went up. We did the same thing this time. This time, with that tax cut, we're seeing the results, and today, to date, Federal tax revenues have gone up. Senator, Federal I, tax revenues are higher in, in this year than they were last year without the tax cut. Respectfully, Senator, I, I was with you in Iowa. I've heard you on the campaign trail since 2012 saying how bad the deficit is. Yes. And, and, and this vote would add to the deficit, though. Uh, J Jason, no, it wouldn't. Th that projection is wrong. By the way, that projection also would have said that the Kennedy tax cuts would have added to the deficit and the Reagan tax cuts would have added to the deficit. The reason we have deficit and debt is not that we cut taxes and spurred the economy. The reason we have deficit and debt is because <laughs> Congress keeps spending. That's Senator, why that we need to time, pass sir. term limits. It's why we need to pass a balanced budget amendment. We need to stop the out of Senator, control that spending. Is your time. Things like socialized medicine. Ninety second medicine response, response Congressman O'Rourke. Ninety second response. Speaking of balance and budgets, um, only one of us has, with good friends in El Paso, started a small business. Uh, met that payroll every week, balanced the books, made sure that we delivered for our clients. Only one of us has served at the local government level every single year balancing the budget, seeing each other not as Republicans and Democrats, but as council members entrusted with a fiduciary responsibility to deliver for the taxpayers of El Paso. Every single year we did. And for Senator Cruz to say that this isn't going to bust the budget at a time of $21 trillion in debt when we're on track to deficit spend to the tune of a trillion dollars a year, he voted to add $2 trillion 
dollars. And those tax cuts disproportionately will flow to corporations who are already sitting on record piles of cash and the already wealthy in a country that is riven with income inequality unseen since the last Gilded Age. Why? In the days just before and just after that vote, Senator Cruz accepted $120,000 from the political action committees who represent the corporate interests <laughs> that benefited from this tax cut. Why does he vote for this? Why does he vote for internet companies to sell your private browsing data to the highest bidder without your consent? Why does he not vote for universal background checks in a country that loses 30,000 people to gun violence every year? Follow the money. In each of these cases, if you look at the political action committee contributions to Senator Cruz, it helps to explain the reasons for his vote and how corrupted Congress has become. I don't take PAC money, not a dime. I always Congressman, that is your time. represent the people of Texas. Congressman, that is your time. Senator Cruz, 60-second rebuttal. You know, Congressman O'Rourke is fond of saying he doesn't take PAC money, but, but the truth is different. For example, the J Street PAC, which is a rabidly anti-Israel PAC, has raised over $160,000 for Congressman O'Rourke because of his many votes against the nation of Israel. Another example, he has a super PAC based up in Dallas that, that has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars is spending them on ads attacking me and my family. So when he say he does, doesn't take PAC money, he just lets others do it for him. But let me say more fundamentally, the reason people care about this is they care about who you're fighting for. Consistently, if you look at Congressman O'Rourke's record, every time there is a choice between left-wing national activists and the people of Texas, he goes with the left-wing national activists and he goes with the left-wing national donors. For example, we were talking earlier about his vote for a $10 a barrel tax on oil. That is a great vote if you're raising money in San Francisco. It's a terrible vote if you actually care about jobs in the state of Senator, Texas. Senator, that is your time. We, we want to keep this uh, debate on track here. Let me ask you the next question, though, Senator. Weber Shanwick did a poll this year with almost 70 percent of Americans saying civility is a major problem in America. Yeah. And let's talk about the tone of this yeah. campaign and what's happened here in the last uh, half hour, 45 minutes. We, we all watched as activists chased you and your wife Heidi out of the restaurant in D.C. And then, Senator, some say you couldn't even give a political free compliment to your opponent in the first debate in Dallas. So the question is, what responsibility do you have to bring civility and respect back to the country? Listen, Jason, I think every one of us has a responsibility to bring civility and respect. That's something I've endeavored to do throughout politics, is to focus on substance, to focus on issues, to focus on record. And so the personal attacks, the going to the gutter that is so common in politics, I try not to engage in. If you look at my disagreements with Congressman O'Rourke, they haven't been personal attacks. They've been his voting record in Congress that has been markedly out of step with the people of Texas. You are right that there, there is a loss of civility, there is an anger, there is a rage on the far left that, that is really frightening. You know, the images of, 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 uh, hold on, let me answer with, don't interrupt me, Jason. The images of, uh, of a left-wing mob beating on the doors of the Supreme Court. That's not good for our country. We can disagree while treating each other with respect, while treating each other with civility. I think that's important to do. We can discuss. Are tax cuts good or is raising taxes good? That, that, that's a discussion we ought to have, but it shouldn't be personal. It shouldn't go down to the gutter. It should focus on actual substance. And let me tell you, I think the lowest point we have seen is the confirmation hearings for Justice Kavanaugh, where we saw Senate Democrats be willing to smear Judge Kavanaugh and his family, be willing to repeat unsupported, uncorroborated allegations and go after him in a way that, that, that I thought was shameful. It was important that that process be fair, that Dr. Ford get a full and fair opportunity to tell her story, that she be treated with respect, and she was, but it was important S that Senator, he that be treated time. with respect as well, and he was not. Senator, that is your time. Congressman O'Rourke, 90 seconds for a response. Every year, Allegheny College presents an award for civility in American politics. One of the first years, it was awarded to Senator John McCain and Vice President Biden. Um, another year, it was awarded to the family of the late Justice Antonin Scalia and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And last year, I was lucky enough, fortunate enough, to receive that award along with Will Hurd. Uh, our ability to travel across the country as a Republican and a Democrat uh, in a car and Facebook live stream the whole thing, but then to get to work in Congress and join one another's legislation to do better for our constituents, regardless of the party differences that might otherwise stand between us, was recognized. 
Um, it's, it's the same kind of approach that I take to just about everything that I do in Congress, everything that I do in life. When we found out that veterans were unable to access mental health care services, that half a million veterans with bad paper discharges were denied the ability to go to the VA, I worked with my colleague from Colorado, Mike Kaufman. Though he's a Republican and I'm a Democrat, we were able to bury the differences, compromise a four-letter word among some in Washington, D.C., and find a consensus piece of legislation that passed the House of Representatives 435 to 0, passed the Senate as well, and was signed into law by President Donald J. Trump. Now, President Trump is someone with whom I don't agree on everything, but where we could make <laughs> things better for those veterans, we did it. We buried the differences, we put them aside, and we put this country's interests before us. That's the kind of leadership that we need from Texas going forward. That's the kind of leadership this country time. deserves. That is your time. Mr. Cruz, in your 60-second rebuttal, I was, I was going to ask you, doesn't the inflammatory rhetoric just exacerbate the situation? I, a, absolutely. I think we should focus on substance and not inflammatory rhetoric. Uh, you, you know, I will say it was striking and at this press conference in D.C. about civility. Congressman O'Rourke again repeated his call for impeaching President Trump. That's the very essence of not civility. If we had impeachment next year, we'd see utter chaos. We would see an end to the repeal of the job-killing regulations that's fueling our, our, our economic growth. We would see an end to many, much of the progress we've seen rebuilding our military, making progress on foreign policy. Washington would be consumed by partisan investigations. That's not civility. Let me point out more, more broadly. It's interesting that Congressman O'Rourke points to a bill that another congressman wrote that he was a co-sponsor of. There's a reason for that. Have you noticed in his campaign, have you noticed in this debate, he doesn't talk about what he has accomplished in Congress because he has scored political points rather than accomplishing victories for the people of Texas. We've already talked about emergency tax relief in the wake of Harvey that I authored, passed into law. That was bipartisan. We had, we had Democrats and Senator Republicans. That was good for Texas. That is your time, Senator. Uh, gentlemen, uh, you know, when it comes to the Me Too movement, the president said it is a very scary time for young men. Congressman, you're raising sons. What do you tell them? I'm raising two sons and, and a daughter. And I tell each of them that it's critically important that they are treated with respect and that they demand that from everyone in their life and that they treat one another and everyone in their life with respect. I'm very grateful for the leadership that we have seen across this country in uh, positions of public trust in Congress, in people at the neighborhood level uh, meeting the challenge of this moment. Um, Congress members like uh, Jackie Speer from California, who authored legislation that I co-sponsored that ensures that members of Congress are held to a higher standard, that there's true transparency in their conduct, and there's not the ability to cover up, and there's the important training to make sure that everyone in their offices, in their lives, is treated with the respect and the dignity that they deserve. I also support the violence against women's act that makes sure that we have the resources and the training and the funding to protect the lives of the women in our lives and in this state and throughout this country inexplicably or, or maybe he'll have an explanation senator cruz voted against the violence against women's act we have to make sure that we're more than just talk we have to have actions that follow this up we've got to make sure that for example when we're talking about women we're talking about equal pay for equal work. When we're talking about women, we talk about ensuring that they can make their own decisions about their own bodies and have access to the health care that allows them to do that. It means that our rhetoric has to be followed up by our actions. And in Senator Cruz, we don't have that today. Congressman, thank you. Uh, in response, Senator, what do you tell your daughters? Uh, I think the Me Too movement <clears throat> has done an incredible amount of good for our country. Sexual assault is wrong, sexual harassment is wrong, and we've seen in recent months powerful men in Hollywood, powerful men in politics, powerful men in journalism, powerful men in business called to account for abominable behavior. I believe everyone, women and men, girls and boys, need to be protected, need to be treated with dignity. And, and, and as you noted, I am the father of two girls. I want them to, their rights to be protected. I want them to be valued. I'm also the son of my mom, who, who graduated from Rice in 1956, went to work at Shell as a computer programmer. She was a professional woman in the 1950s, faced a very difficult climate. My wife, Heidi, my best friend in the world, uh, works in the financial sector. Again, always a difficult client, uh, climate. We need to protect everyone's rights. And, and, and let me tell you, when it comes to stopping sexual assault and when it comes to, to dealing with those who, who commit them, before I was in the Senate, I was the Solicitor General of Texas, the, the, the chief lawyer for the state in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. 
I handled over and over and over again cases dealing with rapists, dealing with those who committed sexual assault, dealing with child predators. It, it, and, and it has been a passion of mine. And Congressman O'Rourke mentioned sexual harassment in Congress. Well, I joined with New York Democrat Kirsten Gillibrand. The two of us were the lead authors on legislation to stop the, the indefensible practice of secret taxpayer settlements for members of Congress who, who, who were harassing their staff. There should be no secret settlements. They That's should be public. Time, and, and it's important Thank that there you. be accountability. Congressman, you get 60 seconds for rebuttal. Listen, I, I pointed out two specific opportunities um, for Senator Cruz to, to do the right thing, one of them being the Violence Against Women Act. Um, didn't hear a, a good reason why he failed to support that. Um, look, you've got somebody, as I mentioned earlier, who is all talk and no action. Um, you've got somebody who left the state of Texas uh, within a year of being elected to represent all of us to run for another office. Hasn't been to all the counties of Texas, but has been to all 99 of Iowa. Has missed a quarter of the votes in 2015, missed half of them in 2016. There's only one other senator from either party over the last 25 years who has a worse, who has a worse record on bipartisanship. In other words, Ted Cruz has a harder time working with members across the aisle than almost anyone else to get anything done. So if he's not showing up in Texas, if he's not showing up in D.C. to vote, who is he showing up for? I want to make sure that whether it is women and the issue that you just asked about now or any other Congressman, priority that we have time. as a state, we have a senator who shows up every single day Gentlemen, for every single one of us. That's your time. Thank you. Let's move on to something different here, too. We have 60 seconds for each of you. We want you to tell us something you've done in the last year that has nothing to do with politics that will give Texans insight to who you are as a person. Senator Cruz, you first. <sighs> Look, I will say the hardest thing about being in this job is being a dad. My, my girls are here at the last, last debate. Congressman O'Rourke and I talked about that. Both of us are dads of young kids. And it is tough. It is tough. Our girls are 7 and 10. Monday morning leaving is really hard. Um, you know, last year I was helped coach Caroline's girls basketball team, the fourth grade basketball team. The, the basketball practices were, were Sunday afternoon, so I was able to be at the practices. As, as Caroline will point out many times, in the course of the whole season, I made it to one game. That's not okay with her. By the way, one of the games that I thought I was gonna make it to was gonna be a Friday night game. I was planning to come back. It was the night of the vote on the tax cut. And so I was in the Senate and I had to call home and say, Caroline, I'm sorry, I've got to be here to vote on this. Let me tell you, for, for a fourth grader, the fact that you're voting to cut taxes is not an explanation for why daddy is not at the game. That's really a hard thing. You know, being a dad, I mean, part of what we do, we, we, we call on, on FaceTime and, and, and we, try to, we try to carve Senator, out every Sunday for the family, but that is hard Senator, and I take being a dad really seriously. Senator, serious. thank you for sharing uh, as well too. Congressman O'Rourke, 60 seconds. Um, you know, I, I, I think much of what Senator Cruz just said resonates with me. We've spent the better part of the last 21 months on the road campaigning in every single county of Texas. Don't get to see um, my kids as much as I want to. Know that Amy takes on the, the lion's share of the burden with a child who's just entered sixth grade, a, another who's in fifth, and, and Henry who's, who's in second. Every now and then we get down in the basement where I have a drum kit that ostensibly was purchased for Henry, but really was for me, um, a PA and, and an amplifier. And uh, me and the kids will rock out, and uh, Amy allows us to do that for a little while. We go to Ulysses uh, travel baseball tournaments. Uh, the last one was in Las Cruces. Uh, I've had them in, in Alamogordo uh, as well. Uh, just went with Molly, who is nursing back to life a blind squirrel that was picked up in East Texas, dropped off in El Paso at a wildlife animal rescue run by Miss Julie. Uh, got to meet this blind squirrel who's uh, slowly regaining its sight. Um, you know, Henry, um, uh, one of the best parts of my day is when I am at home getting to walk him to school and just talking about uh, what he dreamed about the night before and what he's into uh, this day. So with very little time uh, outside of the campaign or my official job, I spend it with my family. Congressman, thank yeah, you for sharing thanks. as well too. We've asked you both a lot of questions tonight. Now we want to let you guys address Texas voters directly. You both get two minutes 
for closing statements here. As we mentioned early on, a flip of the coin gives you the final word tonight, Senator Cruz. Congressman O'Rourke, you're up first. Listen, um, I just want to thank you each for, for moderating this debate, everyone who has been here to witness it, and all those who've made uh, this campaign in the election of our lifetime possible. Um, I was talking to Amy tonight about this moment that stayed with me um, after I first met Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis. Uh, he's meeting with members of the Armed Services Committee, and he reminded us that the United States historically has enjoyed two principal powers that distinguish us from the rest of the world. One is the power of intimidation, to feel the, the most awesome military force the world has ever known. The other, uh, and he thought maybe the greater power, is the power of, of inspiration, uh, to continue to be the indispensable nation that lives up to the promise and the potential of our founders, uh, a, a nation that not just Americans look up to, but the world looks up to. And whether we will remain the inspiration of the world is an open question right now. Walls, Muslim bans, the press as the enemy of the people, taking kids away from their parents after they've survived a horrifying 2,000 mile journey seeking asylum here in this country. The bitterness, the partisanship, the pettiness, the dishonesty that defines so much of the national conversation. We are in desperate need right now of inspiration. But I'll tell you what, traveling the state of Texas, meeting people regardless of their walk of life, their background, their party affiliation, you have inspired me. You've inspired me to transcend the obstacles, to be the big, courageous, bold, strong match for this moment. On any issue that challenges us, uh, in Texas where nearly half of school teachers work a second job just to make ends meet, making sure that we're there for them, pay them a living wage, and ensure that they can teach to the child, not the test. In this state of immigrants, making sure that we lead the national conversation, free dreamers from any fear of deportation, and the least insured state in the country could take the lead on guaranteed, high-quality, universal health care. You have inspired me in this race, and I'm grateful to have the chance that is to represent time, you. Thank you. Senator Cruz, two minutes. The classic question in politics, are you better off now than you were two years ago, is Texas. Elections are about choices. Do we continue on the path we're on, or do we turn back? The records of Congressman O'Rourke and myself could not be more different. On taxes, I want to cut your taxes, Congressman O'Rourke wants to raise them. On job killing regulations, I want to repeal them, Congressman O'Rourke wants to increase them. On Obamacare, I want to repeal Obamacare, reduce premiums, protect pre-existing conditions, and expand access. Congressman O'Rourke wants socialized medicine, the federal government in charge of your health care and your doctor which among other things would threaten to bankrupt Medicare. I want to keep the economic boom we're experiencing right now going, moving forward. Congressman O'Rourke wants the next two years to be drawn into the partisan circus of impeachment proceedings against President Trump. Elections are about who we are. Do we choose fear or do we choose hope? I believe in hope. My mom was the first one in her family to go to college, and she was a pioneer professional woman. My dad came from Cuba with nothing. Washed dishes, making 50 cents an hour, came here seeking the American dream. If someone had approached my dad in 1957 and said, 50 years hence, your son will be a U.S. Senator representing the state of Texas, that teenage immigrant could never have believed it. And yet, as I stood on the Senate floor with my hand on my dad's Bible, there was my father in the gallery, tears running down his eyes only in America. This is a choice about keeping the boom going, keeping, we have the lowest Hispanic unemployment ever recorded, the lowest African-American unemployment ever recorded. Why would we want to screw that up? We need to defend jobs, defend the Constitution, Senator and Cruz, secure our time. borders. That is your time, sir. We appreciate it. Mr. Cruz, Mr. O'Rourke, thank you for sharing tonight. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Quick reminder, our social media response team in Dallas is uh, still watching what's trending from tonight's debate. Tell us what you thought about the candidates. Please use the hashtag as well, Texas Debate. A reminder to our viewers as well, early voting begins on Monday. The election, 21 days away. On November the 6th, we appreciate you watching tonight.
Uh, I'm sorry, let's start that again. Oh, Bud, okay, uh, give me your takeaways there. Yeah. Some people couldn't hear you there. Oh, thank you, thank you. They, uh, yeah. Yeah, Ted Cruz, of course, was very passionate. Uh, Beto O'Rourke this time came out on the attack, which a lot of his supporters wanted him to. However, sometimes he didn't seem very passionate about it. He still seemed like he was a little bit reluctant in his criticism. He was a little, mm -hmm. a little bit stiff about it. Uh, Cruz was very wrapped up in what he was saying. Then you saw the ending, you saw the big sweeping conclusion, mm -hmm. the vision that Beto O'Rourke gave, and, and that uh, you know, contrasted with Ted Cruz say keep the good times rolling. Now, can we real quick, uh, I, I don't know if we can pull it up in the control room right now, that moment that you were talking about where we saw the punch and the counter punch uh, with O'Rourke coming out with a, a, a sort of a different feel than he did in that first debate and then Cruz immediately answering that. Let's see if we can play that interchange here real quick. This is what you can expect over the course of this debate. Uh, Senator Cruz is not going to okay. be honest with you. He's going to make up positions <laughs> and that votes that I've never held or have ever taken. He's dishonest. It's why the president <laughs> called him Lying Ted, and it's why the nickname stuck, because it's true. Well, it, it, it's clear Congressman O'Rourke's pollsters have told him to come out on the attack. So if he wants to insult me and call me a liar, that's fine. Okay, so that but, would, you know, John uh, Adams I would say that that had to be the sharpest uh, moments of the debate there. Uh, do you think that it scored points for either guy? Well, and what was interesting about this was that Ted Cruz turned Beto O'Rourke's tool against him in the first debate, mm -hmm. Beto O'Rourke often sounded like he was part of the audience saying, mm -hmm. saying, uh, you know, there you go again and things like that. Mm -hmm. This time it was uh, Cruz being self-analytical saying, it sounds like Beto O'Rourke's pollsters told him to go on the attack. Mm -hmm. uh, later he kept telling the audience what it seemed like Beto O'Rourke was trying to do, uh, along with the beta, he was using Beto's tool against him. Mm -hmm. Did one of them have to come out uh, a little stronger this time, do you think? I mean, we're down to two debates here between these two. Did one of them have to come out tonight a little bit stronger? Or did one of them have to come out a little bit softer? There was a lot of concern about our work that he had not uh, made the sale on why Texans mm. should fire the incumbent senator. Mm. Uh, a lot of younger voters didn't want him to come out uh, attacking Cruz. They want him to run a different kind of campaign. Mm. But a lot of older voters say, you know, if you don't seem like you'll fight for us, you know, we're not going to vote for you. Mm. And so a, a lot of the older voters uh, kind of got their way in this debate. Boy, it's a real tight rope to walk, isn't it? it? It's tough to please everybody, but the older voters are usually the ones who turn out. They show up. Uh, but I'll let you get back into the computer there. We're going to uh, get back to you here in just a few. Uh, I want to introduce you to our other panel over here. By the way, we are expecting uh, at any moment to be able to go back to San Antonio uh, to speak with, speak with the two debate moderators tonight, our own Jason Whiteley as well as Sarah Forgani. As soon as we get them, uh, we want to pick their brains just about some of the sort of behind the scenes stuff. Uh, but we'd like to introduce you to our panel here, and I'm going to go uh, left to right uh, in the back row and then the front row just to get everybody introduced here. Uh, we have Matt Engel, top left there, Democratic uh, strategist and director of the Lone Star Project. Next to him, we have Jacob Jones, uh, a voter uh, who considers himself independent, uh, and we're going to get to some of his interesting thoughts here, uh, as well as Rania Patrice uh, in the top right up there. She is firmly in the Beto camp here. Uh, down on the bottom here, we have uh, our Republican representative, Wade Emmert, the uh, former chairman of the Dallas County Republican Party. Next to him, we have Lisa Grimaldi Abdul Karim, who is all about Senator Cruz, and uh, she solidified that even more tonight, I think, if it was possible. Uh, and then next to her, we have Jesse Taylor, also very much uh, for Senator Cruz here. Uh, so let's just start down here on the bottom. Wade, uh, did, did your man come out tonight and do what he needed to do? Did Senator Cruz deliver? So what fascinates me is the strategy involved. It was clear that Beto felt like he had to come out and attack, mm -hmm. and that's probably because the polling of the past a week or so has not been favorable to him, mm -hmm. down by as much as nine points. So he felt like he had to swing for the fences and win big. I don't think he did it. He mm. had some good moments, but I also thought Ted Cruz appropriately countered some of those moments and had some home runs himself. So to overcome those polls, then, did he need, did, did Beto O'Rourke need to come out even more aggressive than what we saw tonight? I think he had to come out smarter. Yeah. Uh, and and he, I thought he had some good moments, but I thought overall, uh, Ted Cruz had a very good showing, and you know when you when you balance the two, nothing was gonna. There was not a huge win for Beto. Rania, I saw you up there going up to the top right here. I, I saw you back there taking a lot of notes during the debate, uh, and and I really saw an expression. And and I'll ask you which note stands out to you the most. But I really saw an expression when uh, Senator Cruz was talking, <coughs> and he talked about the fact that he's tried to stay away from personal attacks uh, in this campaign. And I just saw you sh sort of throw your head back. What are your thoughts tonight? after what you saw for the past hour? It, it would be funny if it weren't so absurd. Hmm. Um, I don't even want to repeat the ads because 
they are such blatant lies. Hmm. And I, I don't want to repeat the lies on air or on camera or anything because that doesn't help anything. But it's it's just very, very interesting to me that he can say with a straight face that he stayed away from the criticisms and the attacks and this positive and whatever, how, whatever terminology he used. Mm -hmm. um, when anyone I feel like who's seen any, a lot of his attack ads can pinpoint all the different inaccuracies and hmm. falsehoods hmm. that are out there. Well, let's skip up front to Jesse here. Uh, Jesse, uh, you're an interesting case study because uh, for a lot of your life you didn't necessarily vote reliably Republican. You were telling me you made the switch about four or five years ago. You did elect Senator Cruz for his first term uh, and, and you feel like he did a, a pretty phenomenal job tonight. How have you felt about his first term? Um, I'm, I'm pleased with his first term. Hmm. Um, and when it comes to Beto, I, I get it, especially coming from my community. Uh, Beto comes off like, uh, like a Sunday Baptist preacher. Hmm. He has that feel good, says what you want to hear, but once you put your money in the plate and walk out the door, what do you get? Hmm. So that's where I'm at with Beto. Um, but I'm all, I'm all, for, I'm all for, for Cruz, mm -hmm. and especially when it comes to securing our borders. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, when, when illegals come here, uh, what, what community are they coming in hmm. into? I'm pretty sure they're not moving into Senator Beto community. They're moving into communities that look like me. Hmm. So I'm all about Cruz. You mentioned that, that Beto O'Rourke is a smooth talker. He's a smooth talker. Did smooth he say talker. anything tonight that you thought, that sounds pretty good to me? Uh, nothing that I haven't heard hmm. uh, prior. Like hmm. I said, you put your money in the plate, what do you get after you walk out the door? Hmm. So uh, that's where I, I, I got to go next to you to Lisa here. Uh, Lisa, uh, Jesse's saying that uh, Senator, I mean that uh, Congressman O'Rourke uh, is a smooth talker and says some things that sound really good. I, I get the sense from you that nothing he says sounds very good. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not buying it. And I believe that's why Cruz is debating uh, Beto right now mm. is the, Cruz is the polls, the last five polls that have come out in the last two weeks have Senator Cruz over 50%. Mm. The numbers are there. Cruz, I believe Cruz has it. Mm -hmm. I believe what Cruz is doing is trying to expose Beto for who he is. He, he is a smooth talker, touchy-feely, everything's going to be good, but when it boils down to it, who's going to pay for that? Mm -hmm. Who's going to pay for that? It's that's, great. That's to what you it. were thinking tonight. That's you exactly listening. what I was thinking. Who's going to pay for all this health care for everybody? Hmm. My husband was in a. My husband came over here as a refugee, but he came over here the right way and became a U.S. Right. citizen. Hmm. And I believe everybody should do that. Uh, let's go to the back here, Jacob. Uh, as I spoke about when we introduced everybody, you're sort of an interesting one as well because you're generally uh, lean independent. You were telling me that uh, with fiscal policy anyway, you tend to agree with uh, a lot of the things that Senator Cruz agrees with, but you were telling me you've been steadily leaning more toward O'Rourke. With that specifically, um, the social policies that um, both of the candidates are displaying and the civil rights that both candidates uh, are going for, that is what's pushing me towards uh, Beto. Mm. If it came down to it, I'd prefer the fiscal policies of Cruz and the social and civil policies of Beto and even the personality uh, of Beto himself as well. Mm -hmm. And the combination of that and whenever it comes down to who I want on a national level, I would want someone who is fighting to make sure that civil liberties are addressed just as much as fiscal policy, mm. even if I will disagree with almost every single fiscal policy that Beto is putting forward. Well, that's an interesting thought there. And you, of course, you can't have a combined candidate, you know, when you go in there to <laughs> choose uh, on election night. And I'm just curious, you're leaning toward Beto. Could you change your mind between now and when it's time to vote? The thing that would make me change my mind is if Cruz renounced some of his positions on uh, same-sex marriage, if he uh, pushed for more civil liberties instead of uh, his current positions and uh, going by his current voting record, if he pushed more for civil liberties, if he pushed more uh, to take back his policies on same-sex marriage, 
that would largely push me into the cruise, uh, mm -hmm. into the pool of people voting for cruise. So what I'm hearing here is that you're voting for Beto then uh, when it yeah. comes time to cast that ballot, <laughs> uh, because that is a tall order that's probably not going to happen. Uh, let's talk with uh, Matt Engel now from the Lone Star Project. Matt, uh, we were hearing over here from Bud saying that basically uh, O'Rourke needed to come out tonight, uh, swinging perhaps more so than in the first debate, at least among some voters who want to see that aggression in him, maybe the older voters but he made a good point that the younger voters want him to continue running this different kind of campaign uh, that he has uh, been trying to stand by as he's been going through the past couple of months. Did he walk the tightrope right tonight? Did he do what needed to be done or would you have liked to have seen more of something? Actually, I think he did pull this off, although I'm not sure he did it in the way he intended. I think these debates become less point counterpoint if you just scored it on that. Cruz is an experienced debater. He's done dozens and dozens of debates, so he'll make the point counterpoint. He knows how to frame an attack, and he's always in attack mode. He kind mm. of he drips with insincerity and then attacks. Mm. And whereas Beto has an earnestness about him, and even when he attacked a little bit, you could tell he wasn't particularly comfortable with it. But I think that does really emphasize the fact that he's earnest, he wants to change the culture, and for him to win, he has to appeal to voters who want to change the culture in Washington. Hmm. And everything through that debate said that Ted Cruz will keep the, the, the division going, he's been a part of it, that was what he was all about his first four years in, uh, in the Senate, and Beto makes it clear he wants to try to heal those hmm. wounds. That's what he's got to get voters to think about when they're going to vote. All right. Uh, I want to pop down to uh, San Antonio again uh, right now because, of course, that's where tonight's debate took place. And we've got the moderators uh, standing by to talk to us right now, our own Jason Whiteley, as well as Sarah Forgani from uh, Ken's Five there in San Antonio, our sister station there. Uh, thanks, both of you, for being with us uh, tonight. Uh, contentious debate, but uh, everybody got along pretty nicely there. Uh, I wanted to get your takeaways uh, from this tonight because both of you saw the first debate that happened uh, a little while back. This is the second one, and, and really it's going to be the final one before voters make up their minds here. Uh, did you notice differences between the two candidates tonight versus that first debate? You know, Jason, I'll start out here, too, and forgive me because I don't know where you guys started uh, with the conversation a few minutes ago. Sarah and I just walked in here and plugged in. But I thought one of the biggest differences is going into this, I really expected Beto to be sparring a lot more, interrupting Senator Cruz. That's not necessarily who he is and what he has campaigned on mm -hmm. over the last two years. But I think at this point in the campaign, he likely needs that. With, with polls showing he is seven, eight, nine points down as we're three weeks out, he needs to do something, I think, it appears, according to polls, in order to, you know, push himself forward and get those undecided voters, get those uh, women in the suburbs who might be voting Republican. So I was a little surprised that he didn't, even though he, he attacked really early on in the first question, surprised he really didn't show a little more teeth with uh, Senator Cruz. Sarah? Uh, see, I actually thought uh, it was interesting. There was a point where I thought Representative O'Rourke this time around came out a little bit more aggressive. I mean, at, at one point, uh, he looked directly at Senator Cruz and he said, you are dishonest. You are not an honest person. And he said, you know, the president has called you lying, Ted, for a reason. So I thought it was interesting how this time around he came more with an attack than I thought I saw in the other debate, the first one. That, that's a good point. That was at 814. It is, you know, one of the first comments that I wrote down. He, he did say that. He's dishonest. The president even called him lying, Ted. I think he said that maybe in the first debate as well. It's something I think he's used uh, once or twice. Um, he, he clearly was on the attack tonight, but I, I just I felt like I expected a tad more of sparring and a, a tad more hmm. interrupting. I, again, I qualify that with I know that's not what he has been campaigning on for the last two years. But at this point, we're three weeks out, mm. and something's got to move in the polls. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I thought, too, it was Go interesting toward the very end there. There was actually a few moments what? where there was some levity. You know, mm -hmm. they both looked at each other and smiled and, you know, shared a few laughs. Yeah. And I thought... No, no, go ahead, Jason. I think you were going to ask something. Gonna, you know, I was going to touch on that, actually, uh, Sarah, what you're talking about there. The, the sort of the humanizing moments there at the end, it's, it's almost as though we see two totally different people standing there uh, compared to what we've been watching for most of the hour there. Uh, I wonder how impactful that is with voters, though, because we were running some questions along during the debate uh, at the bottom of the screens and, and asking people to weigh in. And the one that was the most lopsided 
was, will this debate change your mind? 96% of the people who answered said no. 4% said that they could have gone into this tonight with an open mind and maybe changed their minds. These two candidates probably have to know that, that a lot of people have made up their minds at this point. And so really tonight, aren't they just speaking to their bases out there and trying to get them fired up to get them to the polls? Yeah, there, there aren't a lot of undecideds in this race, uh, clearly, as polls have shown, but that, that's the bottom line. Can Congressman O'Rourke flip some of the suburban women who would likely vote Republican, who have voted Repu Republican in the past? That, that is what his campaign is really trying to do. It's really trying to get those younger millennial voters to the polls. There are hard voters to get to the polls, but, I mean, look at the rallies he has had. Mm -hmm. the, the, the number of people he has had at rallies in, in red counties in this state, and he again talked about how he... Um, he took a jab at uh, Senator Cruz about how I, I know the senator hasn't had a chance to get to talk to farmers in, mm. in you know, a smaller town because, uh, you know, the congressman's talking about the 254 counties that he has visited. Some interesting moments, and as you were about to mention, too, um, the genuine moment tonight, I thought was... Senator Cruz. He had it when we asked mm. the question about, you know, forget politics. Mm. Tell us something about mm. you in the last year. And he paused for a moment. And he got emotional, he, actually. He did. You know, he, he kind of softened up quite a bit. I mean, you, we went in the whole debate, and he was just, you know, fired up one question after the next. And then we get to that, and you could see he just pauses and then softens up. And it's interesting because there was, uh, I was just reading a, a Quinnipiac poll, I believe, survey sh said that a lot of women uh, tend to lean toward O'Rourke, and a lot of the men are leaning toward Cruz. Right. So I wonder if this sort of plays mm. in his favor when he just kind of, you know, stepped back for a minute and really showed us that he's just a man. He's the father, mm. yeah. uh, you know, to daughters. And, and he just wants mm -hmm. to be part of their family, a family man. I must, and, and, you oh, know, fine. listen, Jason, it's, I, I've talked to these guys quite a bit. It's hard to throw them off, both mm -hmm. of them. These guys are yeah. pros at what they do. They know their positions. They know what they believe in. And that was a moment in the debate, probably, you know, 8.50 or so, hmm. that really kind of made them pause for a moment. You know, Beto O'Rourke said something about, uh, about his fifth, sixth, and second graders and the drum kit mm -hmm. uh, that they have mm -hmm. downstairs, the PA and the amplifier, and how they go down there and jam out. And uh, Mrs. O'Rourke kind of allows that. We heard, yeah. the, you know, the emotional moment uh, from the senator as well, talking about how hard it is to be on the floor of the Senate on Friday nights when his daughter is waiting to uh, have him in the in the stands at the basketball game. Jason, yeah, I have to, to say, ahead. yeah, I have to say that uh, you know you you mentioned that we've heard so much from both of them, and you almost know how they're going to answer on a lot of things. And I did feel the same way, uh, Jason, that it feels like uh, they both kind of went back on their heels there when they were asked about a non-political question. And whether you have your mind made up or not, and it sounds like most people do, it was kind of refreshing just to get to that point uh, in the debate and to be able to see these as two men, two people who have very different views of, of where this country should go and where this state should go. Uh, I want to say that you all are both very good timekeepers, by the way, uh, because it is difficult to get in there. And I think at one point we heard some groans from the audience, uh, Jason, when uh, you, you were basically told not to not to interrupt there uh, as he was going on. Uh, and, right. and, and I want to want to ask this because in the beginning, it seems like we had this fantasy of five and maybe six debates. Well, it got whittled down to two here. And it seems like these two men have so much to say. It's kind of a surprise that they didn't agree to face off more times. Yeah, you know, uh, Beto originally wanted six debates back in April, March or April. Uh, Ted Cruz took a little while, but he responded with five debates. They couldn't agree on the first Dallas debate. It finally happened. Uh, then they had the issue with the, uh, the vote on Kavanaugh, which postponed um, and essentially eliminated the Houston debate. And this is, this is likely the last one. It's the first statewide debate. I think we had 14 television stations uh, broadcasting this across all corners of Texas. Um, it was also on C-SPAN as well, too. But this is likely the last time they'll spar together. There's a chance, as you all likely know from watching the news, that they might get together Thursday night down in the Rio Grande Valley on CNN. It's a, uh, a, an appointment that the senator said he couldn't make, and now he said he can make. But CNN says, hey, you, you know, you declined it already. Check with uh, Beto and see if they'll allow you in. And I believe I want to say, as of earlier today, I was looking at it, and they said that uh, O'Rourke had agreed to that town hall with CNN, but so far Cruz has said he would only agree to a debate, not a town hall. So this right. may very well, this is it. This is, mm. it, you know, the last time that they're actually going to be 
you know, facing each other and debating. Yeah, it, it very well could. Let me, let me point out something that, that I haven't heard, and, and you guys watching this and commenting might tell me that I'm crazy that it's been out there. But there was, a, there was actually a, kind of a good point that Senator Cruz made uh, on the question that Sarah asked about uh, immigration policy, specifically mm. about border security. And, and one, one point that Congressman O'Rourke continuously relies on, and he is correct, El Paso is a safe city. It, they have mm. the big banners downtown on the light poles. If you've been to El Paso lately, the past few years, this says, you know, one of the safest cities in America or the safest city in America. Mm. Uh, Congressman, uh, Senator Cruz came back with a, a really great question on this. Well, the, the border fence. Mm is in El Paso, downtown El Paso. And if you've been to El Paso, you see the border fence. You can't miss it. There's miles and miles of it right there in the metropolitan area separating Juarez from El Paso. And the senator said, well, the border fence is what makes El Paso safe. Mm. So two very different opinions on that and what makes that city safe. Yeah, and I want to go back to that point because we talked about, you know, how when we asked him the question, what have they achieved over the last year, how they kind of stepped back and softened up. But when it came down to the closing remarks, I think Senator Cruz took advantage uh, of those two minutes very clearly and really showcased how different both of them are how mm. different he is from Representative O'Rourke mm -hmm. on pretty much every topic from climate change, immigration policy, to uh, taxes, to the national debt. I mean, you're looking at two candidates who couldn't be more different. Yeah, and I think the only thing they said they agreed on was go about ahead. tariffs, Jason. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. What? Oh, the tariffs. No, the, yeah. I think the only thing they said they agreed on was, was about trade but not about tariffs and whether the Senate should step mm -hmm. in and stop what President Trump is doing trying to uh, balance out trade agreements. Yeah, ahead, otherwise Jason. there couldn't be more of a contrast between these two. Nobody should have any trouble being able to discern uh, which one they like and right. don't like because they are very different from one another. Uh, Jason Whiteley and Sarah Forgani, uh, thanks for uh, being with us here on Facebook Live and uh, great job tonight. I know it is a thankless job to moderate a debate, especially in this political climate we have these days. I uh, want to turn to our social response team over here real quick. Once again, we have Alicia Ibrahimji over here uh, who has been uh, on the screen all night here. And uh, you have something you'd like to pass along to us here. Yeah, definitely. So we're asking, you know, you see on the screen on Facebook Live, we've been polling people. Who do you think won this debate? Mm -hmm. It's important that we keep in mind that every social media space has a different type of audience, right? right? So on the screen right now in our live stream, you see 73% they've said, you know, Beto clearly won this one. 27% yeah. said Cruz clearly won this one. But in the comment section of this Facebook Live that we have going, We've got, look, 745 people of you are in that Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. It's been really conflicted back and mm. forth. Just as soon as I see a Cruz comment, I see a Beto comment right away. Mm. Um, I but yet the vote isn't showing that here. But, you know, exactly. again, we do have to qualify. It's never scientific when you're just taking a quick poll on social media. Right. It just happens to be who's going to take the time and click one or the other. Right. So I tweeted this out as well. We've retweeted this on the main account. Okay. Similar numbers here. We so see it's kind of backed up. Uh, you know, you were mentioning platforms. Right. It can be different. This is on Twitter now. Exactly. So I think that's really important to know that different platforms, different audiences, but still similar numbers here. 70% saying Beto clearly took the cake on this one. 30% said they think that Cruz did and that's 826 of you on Twitter voting. I will say this though, it's been interesting. Mm. I'm sure even after we finish this, we're still all gonna be mm. attached to our screens, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many things that people are saying on the various topics that were discussed. Um, the conversation is gonna continue, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. but there has been no shortage of participation. I do wanna emphasize that. It's been really incredible to see the amount of people mm. commenting and really just sort of sharing the conversation. So it's Very been nice. positive. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Yeah. Uh, you know, we wonder about that participation when we talk about people getting on social media and making their voices heard there. Does that translate over though, uh, over the next couple of weeks when we get into early voting and then when we get to election day, of course, uh, do people show up at the polls? And that's what this is really all about isn't it? Mobilizing those voters. Uh, Ted Cruz has maintained this uh, pretty decent lead, Wade, but uh, he can't take anything for granted at this point either. Well, you never should take anything for granted, but I, I think what's hurting the Democrats in general is that there's not really a competitive governor's race either. Mm -hmm. And so Beto's race is really the, the hallmark race for Democrats, and I frankly don't know that he, although he's getting some good marks, I think the table is turning a little bit, and you're mm -hmm. starting to see his his uh, margins go down and Ted Cruz's margins go above 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as we sit here today, one, only one in 50 likely voters have not decided who they're voting for mm -hmm. in this race. So the reality is 
uh, this case, uh, this race, I think, is already decided. It's just a question of getting folks out to vote. Mm. And um, I think the, the the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing has in, in told Republicans, you better get out to vote or things could change. Matt, let me take you back over to what she was just talking about, about these, again, unscientific polls, because it's on social media, it's spur of the moment, people picking a winner, uh, and, and we have no idea who's on social media at any given time. Does it make you feel good uh, that you're seeing the Democratic candidate here in overwhelming numbers in these social media polls anyway, uh, doing well tonight as the winner of the debate? Honestly, it doesn't surprise me. I, I thought just in watching that debate that uh, Beto came across as the earnest, positive person who wants to make a change, whereas Cruz, it's just his style. It's just he can't help it. Hmm. He comes across as always in the attack mode. There's a dark presence to him. If that was an audition for a movie, Cruz would have won the role as the bad guy hmm. because he plays that part. Um, last quick thing here because we're wrapping up now. We have our two Cruz supporters sitting up front, our two Beto supporters sitting behind them. Uh, show of hands, uh, how certain are you that you will be voting and uh, that you will be pulling as many of people from your circle as you can get to make it to the polls as well? And I'd like to say Cruz is, is doing a Trump, Trump, they're doing a rally on Monday down in Houston. Hmm. There's a group of us going down there, so I think that's going to really fire up Republican voters. But and, both and sides, Democratic voters. But both sides here feeling good tonight. Yes. Yeah. I also think it's really important to point out that most polls are polling consistent voters, and I understand this is something everyone gets excited and hangs their hat on, but. It, it is always going to come down to turnout, and if young people show up, hmm. it's going. There's going to be a disappointed GOP. That's those millennials that we were talking about. Thank you all uh, for sharing uh, your thoughts and opinions tonight. Uh, I got to get back over here because we're about to be uh, out of time here because we got to move everything out so that we can do the 10 o'clock news on uh, WFAA TV here in just a little bit. We want to let you know we're not totally dismantling the th these things though. So if you want to keep that conversation going on social media, we know that you have a lot to say. Keep it coming here. And uh, thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, this is a, a great exercise in democracy to hear all of these different voices. We really appreciate it. More coverage tonight at 10 on WFAA-TV.